This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. Okay, the question from Arizona I received via email says, A Muslim friend of mine sent me a list of 101 contradictions of the Bible. He says these contradictions prove that the Bible is not inspired. How do you answer these obvious contradictions? Well, <laughs> let's take a look at them and see if they're so obvious. Uh, as I said, I, uh, we, I don't have uh, the time or the desire, frankly, to uh, unravel all 101. But I, I want to take a look at several of them so that you can see how the scriptures are being misrepresented by those who want to say that there are contradictions found in the Bible. The, the first one has to do with what time the women came to the tomb. It's alleged that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give four different times, and therefore they, they contradict each other. We're going to read all four accounts, just a verse from each one in rapid succession. Here they are. Matthew 28 in verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Mark 16 and verse 2. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Luke 24 and verse 1. <clears throat> but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. John 20 and verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Now, I hope you could see as we went through those very quickly that there is really no contradiction here you force your conclusion into the text if you say that there are different times. While, while Matthew says, as it began to dawn, and Mark says, when the sun had risen, and Luke says, early dawn, and John says, while it was still dark, those are not contradictions. It's simply describing um, that uh, very brief period of time between the time that it's dark in the morning and the time that it becomes light. There is that area where it's kind of dark, it's kind of light, it's kind of bright, the sun's not. You know, here in Arizona, uh, it's very bright out before you see the sun come up because there's nothing to the east of us to really keep, to block the sun, and so we have a lot of sunlight. I've lived in places or been places before, up in the mountains of Colorado, for example, in a valley where, where it was dark until, pretty dark, until you actually saw the sun come up. So they, what, what they're doing here, what the Muslims are trying to do here, is find differences in the four gospel accounts and call them contradictions. They're not contradictions. They're simply different explanations, different ways of looking at it, as you would expect from different individuals, a little different viewpoint. Let's look at another one here they claim is a contradiction. How many people came to the tomb? It's alleged that in the gospel accounts there are different numbers given. Let's read them again as we have before. Matthew 28 and verse 1. Now when after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Mark 16 verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Luke 24 and verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb 
bringing the spices which they had prepared. Luke 24 and verse 10. Now when uh, now now they they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and also the other women who uh, with them were telling these things to the apostles and uh, John 20 and verse 1. Now on the first day of the week Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. None of these accounts, as you can see, denies that there are other women there. He simply mentions, Matthew mentions one group, Mark mentions another, Luke, John. No contradiction, just additional information that uh, one or the other um, presents to us. I think of it this way, if, um, if I was telling you a story and I knew that you knew Joanne, for example, I, and Joanne was there, you knew Joanne, I'd mention Joanne. If you didn't know Joanne, it's not necessarily to, necessary for the story to tell you about Joanne's presence. Same thing is true as, of Mary, the mother of James, or Mary Magdalene. The audience to whom Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were writing uh, and who were familiar with those individuals, they used those individuals to tell the story. None of them is saying Mary is the only one who went to the tomb. That's, that's not there. You, you're reading that into it when you come to these gospel accounts. Each gospel writer seems to single out one or more of the people that he wants to mention without denying the presence of the others in order to tell his story. Uh, no contradiction here, but if you if you start with the preconceived idea that there are con contradictions, then you can twist this. You see how that's done? To make it appear to be there. Now, here's another example of that. What, what was their purpose of coming to the tomb? Now, here is an artificial question with regard to the purpose for coming to the tomb imposed upon the uh, upon the record, and it's alleged that the different accounts give different purposes for going to the tomb. Matthew says that they went to see the tomb. The other accounts said that they brought spices to anoint him. So the Muslims say, see, there it is. There's a cr clear contradiction. Matthew says one thing, the others say another thing. Well, most of these contradictions that are artificially imposed upon the passages that we're looking at um, come from a misunderstanding of how the story was related to us. None of the gospel writers, in fact, the, the Bible, we can make this broad statement, the Bible is not given to us in a chronological way. That's one of the things that, that we Westerners find frustrating from time to time because you do begin at the beginning in Genesis, but when you go through the Old Testament, not everything is found in chronological order. And that is because most of the world uh, does not find it absolutely necessary to tell a story in chronological order. What's, what's important for most cultures is to have the story, not necessarily the timeline. We Westerners almost have to have a timeline to put the story together, and that's, that's because that's the way that we look at things. But Bible writers often just tell the story without paying much attention to the timeline involved. In this case, talking about their purpose is, is really not what the Scripture is trying to tell us in this story. And so when you find a difference there, it's only a point-in-time difference. Did they come to the tomb to anoint him with spices? Yeah. Did they come just to see what the tomb, what was happening at the tomb? Yeah. At one point in time, they were just coming to look. At another point in time, they were coming there with a purpose, if you want to impose that, to anoint him with spices. We'll look at another one of these supposed contradictions when we come back in just a minute. Let me remind you, just before I look at this next supposed contradiction, that the Copper Basin Family Encampment will meet July 30th through August 2nd this year 
here in Prescott, Arizona. Men from all over the country will be bringing great lessons on the theme, The Mind of Christ in You from the book of Philippians. And you are invited to come and attend that encampment absolutely free. You have to take care of your own housing expenses and meal expenses. Uh, You understand that. But the Bible encampment, the family encampment, is absolutely without cost whatsoever. There are classes for all age groups. Bring your kids. That's what a family encampment is all about. They will enjoy the Bible instruction that they receive. There are classes for men and for women, uh, combined classes. Uh, We begin on a Saturday night and we go through Tuesday night. There are all kinds of activities here in Prescott um, for your off times. We have time in the afternoon between sessions where you can enjoy the sights of Prescott. So don't forget, Copper Basin Family Encampment, July 30th through August 2nd. Come and be with us. Now, here's another supposed contradiction. Was the tomb opened or closed when Mary arrived? Now, what they, what the Muslims claim here is that Matthew indicates that the to- tomb was closed. Mark, Luke, and John all indicate that when they got there, the tomb was open. Let's just read Matthew's account and see if he says that the tomb was closed. Matthew 28 and verse 2. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Now, you, you see what they're trying to do here? Again, they start with a conclusion And the conclusion that they start with that they want to prove is that the Bible has contradictions. And then they take things out of their context in an attempt to make them say things that they do not say. Matthew is simply telling us how the stone was moved. He is not saying that he was an eyewitness to it being moved. Now, in the other accounts, when they see the tomb, it is open. Matthew is simply telling us what took place. This is, this is one of the things that the Muslims do regularly with the Bible. They confuse a point in time with another point in time. When Matthew talks about the stone being rolled away, he's talking about a point in time that that event took place. When Luke and John... Uh, talk about the tomb being open, they're talking about another point in time different from the point in time that Matthew is talking about. So there's no contradictions. They're just simply looking at things at a different point in time. Uh, I think that we can illustrate that with this next supposed contradiction. Who was at the tomb when they arrived? Well, here we have Matthew in Matthew 28, verses 2 through 7, saying that there was one angel at the tomb when they arrived. In Mark 16 and verse 5, Mark says there was one young man there. In Luke 24 and verse 4, Luke says that there were two men there. In John, we have uh, John 20 and verse 12, we have two angels there. And here we have several misconceptions combined into one. Number one, they say, which is it? Was it a man or men or angels? Because here we have these accounts saying young men, two accounts saying men, two accounts saying angels. The fact of the matter is, in the Bible, when angels are present, they very often, in fact, in every instance in the Bible, they appear to be men. They, uh, they don't float down from heaven with great wingspans. That's the Hollywood misconception. Angels, uh, an- I, I hate to destroy any misconception you may have. Angels don't have wings, folks. The seraphim, yeah, but 
it's not John Travolta with the big white, what, a, what were they, 25-foot wingspans coming at you. That, that's not the way that it is. When, when angels appear in the Bible, they appear to be men. Let me give you an example of that in, in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. It's clear that these young men in Mark's account and the two men in Luke's account were angels. It's interesting to me that the, the angels always look a little bit different. Uh, you, can even, you can go back to the account in, in Genesis chapter 19 uh, where angels were sent to rescue Abraham and Lot. You remember that account? And uh, there was something very special about those men that came on the, on the scene, so, so special that the whole community, well, go back and read it. Go back and read that account, and, and you'll see. When angels visit us, we don't recognize them as angels, per se. The Hebrew writer says some have entertained angels unaware. That's the way it goes. Now, there may be something different about them that stands out in the Bible record, and, and in these places, it's the white clothing something special about them, but they appear to be men. So two accounts tell us that they were men. Two accounts tell us that they were angels. Contradiction? No. It's just the way the eyewitness viewed them at that point in time. Why then the difference in the number? Well, one angel appeared at a given time. Two appeared at another time. None of the sacred writers seems to claim that he's mentioning all of the circumstances in this account. Every single one of the gospel accounts gives his own perspective and plugs us into one point in time that may be a little bit different from another writer's point in time. You, you cannot pit these verses against one another. They're simply illuminating on the information, adding additional information, or giving us a brief explanation <clears throat> without contradiction of the other. Um, I, I think that's further illustrated by this next supposed contradiction. Where were the messengers situated? The Muslims say, well, they're, they've got these angels and men, whatever they are, in different places. Matthew says, Matthew 28, verse 2, that the angel was sitting on the stone. Mark says... 16 verse 5 that the young men were sitting inside the tomb one on the right Luke 24 and verse 4 says there were two men standing inside the tomb John 20 and verse 12 says there are two angels sitting on each side of the bed and and here we again have the same explanation there's no contradiction here Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are simply telling us what happened at one point in time, which may differ from the one point in time that the other gospel writer is giving us an explanation of. There's no contradictions here whatsoever. There's simply additional details. We'll look at the last, well, let's see. Yeah, the, the last couple that I'm going to deal with. As I said, I... I don't have any desire to go through all 101 with you, but I think these are enough to illustrate how, and I think this is going to happen in the future, by the way, more and more in the future. As the Muslim world begins uh, to disappear, because I think people are, are wise enough to see the inconsistencies in Islam, They're, they are going to try to cast aspersions on the scriptures. And they're going to try to cause doubt. And they, these kind of things do cause doubt for those who are unable to study um, for themselves and dig these things out. But we will see more and more of these kind of attacks. And what we need to do is to make sure that we study, study, study to see that uh, you cannot 
pit these verses against each other successfully and call it a contradiction. And we'll look at one, one more of them or two when we come back in just a minute. Okay, here's another one. Did the women tell what happened in the gospel accounts? Muslims say, Matthew says, yes, they told what happened. Mark says, they say, Mark 16, verse 8, no, they don't tell. Luke 24, yes, they tell what happened. John, yes, they tell. Well, let, let's look at uh, Matthew 28, 8. It says, And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran and reported it to the disciples. Now let's look at Mark 16, verse 8. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So, it looks like we have a genuine contradiction here, doesn't it? Ah, maybe they're right. They can't get this story straight. One of them says they told, one of them says they didn't. Which one is right? Well, you remember our study in context, context, context. Do you remember that study? In fact, in the future, we're going to rebroadcast how to study the Bible. Context, context, context. Look at Mark 16, verses 9 through 11. Now, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and reported those things. Uh, she went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe it. Do you, do you, see, you see what's happening here? Do you see the explanation of the plausible, very plausible explanation here? Again, we go back to our timeline. They're not all telling about what happened in sequence. They're telling you the story. Right after this event occurred, they, they're not confident enough to tell the disciples, even the disciples, that this resurrection had occurred. Why? Because the disciples wouldn't believe them. That's why. Later, later, they do tell. So while it's not immediately, they do tell. So you can't make that into a contradiction. Let me remind you of an event that occurred in the book of Acts when Peter was in jail. The whole church gathers together to pray that Peter might be released. Do you remember that story? And they're praying fervently that Peter might be released. As an answer to that prayer, God unleashes Peter from prison. Angels release the bonds. The doors of the prison fly open. Peter goes directly to the place where the church is meeting for prayer, and he knocks on the door. Rhoda comes to the door. She says, who is it? Something like that. Peter says, it's me, Peter. Rhoda gets so exci excited, she runs in, and she says to the disciples, it's Peter, it's Peter. And the disciples say to her, you must be crazy. We're praying for him to be released. It can't be Peter. <laughs> you see? You see what's happening here? They, they can't believe that the answer to their prayer is there outside of the door. The same thing is true after Jesus' resurrection. They witness it. They, they're hesitant to tell people who aren't going to accept it readily, but later they tell the whole story. So we're not talking about a contradiction here. We're just simply talking about how things happen at different points in time. We'll look at some more interesting Bible studies when we come back next week. God bless you. See you then. Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.